My name is Dr. Josephine Palermo and my superpower is creating business cultures that transform organizations team by team. Today I'm joined by Ian, my wonderful co-host, for a discussion about imposter syndrome. We chat about why this happens and what are the impacts for both individuals and organizations. I know you're going to relate to this discussion. I wanted to chat with you today about imposter syndrome. It's kind of front of mind for me at the moment. Um, a couple of weeks ago, I led, I helped to lead a brilliant uh, leadership development workshop uh, in, Cent in Canberra, in our, in our national capital, bringing together 32 amazing people, um, most of whom said at some stage, even though they'd been awarded a prestigious scholarship to study overseas, they had experienced imposter syndrome while they were away. And I, I had also received that scholarship. And while I, I remember being invited to a special event at the Kennedy Center in New York, where there were hundreds of uh, alumni from what's called the Fulbright Scholarship Program. Um, and most of them said that they experienced imposter syndrome. People from all around the world who were the bro most bright, passionate people so very accomplished Had, as well. Yeah. We all walked around saying, how come you picked me? And mm. in Canberra two weeks ago, people said the same thing. And it just occurred to me that uh, often people who are the most skilled and gifted and humble are often the ones that experience self-doubt. Uh, and I guess it's quite interesting. Sure. Like, is that, a, is, that, is that an aspect of true leadership? Or is it that somehow the organisations we work in maybe don't offer enough feedback to help us believe that we're actually up for it, you know, for these leadership experiences? I don't know. I wanted to chat to you about it and see what listeners had to think. I think this is a really good topic because um, a lot of the work that I'm doing in uh, gender um, also touches on this notion that that women tend to feel this, to feel the impacts of, of imposter syndrome. And, and when, we, when we think about, you know, what that is, it's the fear of not living up to some kind of expectation of others or, mm. that, or that there's a possibility that they'll find out that I'm not good enough or I'm, I don't know what I, you know, what I'm saying I know or there's this, there's this lack. And, and so I, a lot of the, uh, I'm, I'm writing a book at the moment on women and power and a lot of the interviews uh, with women that I, that I was very privileged to do, we touched on this and again, very accomplished women, skillful women who are saying, you know, that there's this kind, there's this um, deep rooted fear around not being good enough. And so, um, so I think it's a really, really interesting topic as well. Um, and, you know, I was listening to a podcast by uh, Michael Lewis, who's written um, a number of best selling books, but he's also a podcast host for a podcast called um, Against the Rules. And he's, He's actually doing a bit of a deep dive on experts and how we use experts to um, either um, confirm some of our beliefs or disconfirm some of our beliefs. And so he touched on this and he was actually interviewing Maria Konnikova, who wrote The Confidence Game, which is um, a real uh, in-depth um, assessment, in, uh, but a very easy read about confidence and, and the ways in which confidence plays out. And he was um, actually um, talking about a, uh, a, a woman who's a female doctor. And I found this story amazing. So I'm going to tell you this story, Ian. Can I tell you a story? Yeah, go for it. Okay. So he was telling us about a woman who, and she, he actually had her on the podcast. Now, this woman was a female doctor and she's actually of, uh, I think, Anglo-Indian um, background, American. And she was on an, a, a flight, a, a domestic flight. And she was sitting there with her husband at the, and um, suddenly uh, there was a, a man behind her, just very in cl very close proximity, who just collapsed. And he obviously was very unwell. He just collapsed onto the floor. And uh, the flight attendant came over and, you know, and, and I think there was an announcement, is there a doctor on the plane? We need some help. And so she put up her hand and said, yes, I'm a doctor. And in fact, she's 
she was she's not just a GP she's actually a specialist in emergency response and she'd been working in the military for many years before she was a general practice practitioner so if you're going to get anyone who knows how to respond in a situation like that it was a perfect person to have on the plane and help this poor man who was obviously in dire straits wow. the flight the flight attendant also noticed that someone behind her in the seat behind her put up his hand and he said and he was a big strapping bloke um much bigger yeah. than her physically and he put up his hand and said uh i'm a nurse so the flight attendant then proceeded to ask the nurse to come and assist the man who needed help and at when when uh this woman's husband saw that he actually said to the flight attendant no 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 really she is a doctor she's a real doctor because i guess you know you and i are doctors but we're phd doctors we couldn't yeah. respond in a situation like that and the flight attendant looked at him and and it was almost like she was invisible she was sitting right next to him but the flight oh. attendant looked at him and said it's okay sir we have all the help we need mm. and so you have this situation where this where this a bias going on where the the woman who obviously is the expert who obviously has well from our point of view who obvious who has the skills but the situation is biased towards choosing a big uh, man who takes up more mm. physical space and who is a male and and you know there's a bias towards assuming that his acknowledgement of his skill set is going to trump hers you know um so so it, it it was astonishing. That story was astonishing. And this woman actually thought that it was just an isolated experience. But then she joined an online group of other female doctors. And there were a number of them who had had a very similar experience on American um, airlines. Wow. It's interesting because uh, that big strapping man who was a nurse could have deferred to her and said, well... She right. has the expertise that's actually more relevant in this situation than mine. Exactly. So, so what's playing out there is he's there's a there's a uh, hubris there for him, and he's he's overconfident, perhaps, um, mm. but, or maybe he's just not because he obviously heard all of this conversation too. So he's disregarding it. He's disregarding the information. Uh, interesting. It's funny because I'm six foot five and a white male, and. Um, I've spent my life kind of almost stooping somewhat to accommodate the fact that I'm so tall, but also sometimes to minimise uh, the visual impact that I have on on people who are of shorter stature than me. Um, and it almost becomes, I sort of embody that self-limiting stance in my posture, uh, yeah. partly because I don't want to scare people. Yeah. Um, but... Uh, in the past, I've had people say to me, you should embrace your power more. You need to stand up and um, and embrace the power that you have by virtue of your expertise and who you are. Um, it actually can take time to learn to run with that, um, especially if we're working in environments that maybe are indifferent to harnessing and developing people's leadership. I mean, I've worked in lots of different organisational settings and I've watched amazingly incompetent people rise up the ranks because they're good at saying what people want to hear. doesn't mean they're particularly bright. Exactly. And I think this is the, th the problem. I think we have our systems that are particularly biased towards confidence and overconfidence. And when you think about organisations in particular, very biased towards overconfidence to a point where, you know, some of our – some organisations have, have placed a more – um, focus on assessment during recruitment so that people are asked to actually do something in real time to show their competence. But but in the end, we, we, I see a lot of leaders who will, um, who will be overconfident about what they know and therefore not curious and ask questions. And that then leads to a lack of innovation in the organisation and a dilution um, of expertise because they're not, they're not they're leveraging the expertise in that organisation. Um, so yes. what do you think's going on there? I know you were looking at a the Dunning Kruger effect. So do you want to have? Do you want to just yeah, give us an I, idea of what that is? Because there's something going on. There's something going on. I happen to have seen this um, a diagram uh, in an organisation I've 
been working in lately called the Dunning-Kruger effect. And it's a, it's a graph on the vertical axis is confidence and on the horizontal axis is competence. And it shows that as your competence uh, is at lowest levels, for some people, they will leap up with the most extreme confidence and say, I know it all already. And that's called incompetent hubris, where you may not actually know much stuff at all, but you fake it and you demon, you sort of the, the strutting rooster who's 95% feather duster who says, I know everything there is to know. Um, and as, let's say, it's a journey for that particular person who's got some capacity for insight, once they actually start having to perform a task, their confidence will drop considerably and they'll go, oh my God, I was wrong. This is much harder than I thought. If they have an opportunity to keep developing, their, their, their confidence will bottom out above the level of zero. They'll reach an average level of competence and they'll say, okay, I'm starting to get it now. I think I actually understand this, but my goodness, it's hard. And then as they continue to build up their expertise over time, their, conf their confidence will start to increase again. And they'll get to a point where they'll say, okay, I feel like I'm now in flow with the, with the subject. My confidence now matches the competence required to execute this role effectively. Uh, but it's much lower than that initial burst of hubris. So they're sort of, um, they've had a few sharp edges flambéed off. They're probably a little bit singed, but they've learnt to act with some dignity and with some grace, and they're probably matching the role, you know? Um, and I was struck by that because, um, I mean, I, know, I, don't, I don't think that, 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 sh that the shape of that curve does not apply to everybody, and I guess it's, it's, it's maybe assuming that people have the capacity to generate insight, and, you know, Absolutely. we all know... Absolutely. Yeah. And I think that when you have, particularly when you have a, a, uh, in um, society where you have social inequality due to status and privilege and power, you, you that probably has an impact as well, because you're, um, if you're in a, in a position of um, social power or uh, even in, in an organisation, hierarchical power or position power, then you're less likely to be challenged, aren't you? So you're less like, you know, what's the trigger for you to to, to get that practice, that self um, review or self assessment practice? Yeah. Um, so I guess certain organisational situations, the culture that we have, um, that can you know somehow reward dodgy businessmen with shall I say, President of the United States, people that are actually uh, are, not, are completely full of hubris and very little talent um, somehow end up in senior roles. The, the culture actually rewards that. Um, and it's amazing how many people that are amazingly gifted are working in organisational settings in which there isn't even really a strong interest in finding out what they know. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And it's such a waste, isn't it? And, it's and a tragedy. People, it's a, it is an absolute tragedy. And particularly, again, when I think about it from a gender lens, you've got a lot of women who are still navigating very masculine cultures in organisations and very masculine bias. You know, in other words, there's a bias towards a more individualised versus a collective approach in the organisation. And so... So they will, um, they will in particular be um, faced with feedback that, that doesn't encourage them to shift to confidence. So, you know, what do, what do you do? Because you, if the feedback system, if the organisational feedback system doesn't encourage you to, comp to competence and confidence, then, then you're left to your own self-limiting beliefs. And this is why there's a level of awareness, I think, that you need at both levels you need it from that person in that position power and that leadership power but there's a level of awareness around that bias that you also need for all people in the organization and i mean you're very aware ian that's why you know um 
that's why you're saying you, you as a big you know physical presence you you you're aware of your presence but many people aren't aware of that but you know you're you're regulating that but at the same time um you know i i have self-limiting beliefs about my skills and my um, expertise i'm sure you have self-limiting we all have them it's part of our shadow self so it's it's actually um interesting to think about how we manage that i'm actually now thinking about the dunning kruger effect in the light of uh, the british prime minister boris johnson who's finally decided to step down after yes. most of his cabinet resigned it occurs to me i mean he's being described as uniquely incompetent and full full of self-interest he, he seems to strike me as the early stage of the dunning kruger effect um, and somehow he's been rewarded uh, and those organisational structures, uh, you know, where they are a pyramidical structure and you have the rooster at the top, people around them who are also hungry for power and whatever, that becomes a sort of group think or a group dynamic that punishes people for suggesting that the emperor might not have many clothes on. Uh uh, it's, yeah, I just wonder what's the way through that. I mean, if if you if you push back against something, you will you may be punished, or you may just have to find a different organisational setting. Um, but what if the zeitgeist rewards that? Exactly, and I think I think you've kind of hit the nail on the head because um, right now I'm starting to feel very very depressed about what we're talking about it feels yeah. it feels like it's bleak but it's not as bleak as i think we can because we we still have agency we still have choice so looking for cultures that encourage you to learn and grow and and cultures where leaders are also encouraged to go into that self-reflection and self-review and where there's more of an equity around the currency of ideas. In other words, anyone can come up with a good idea. It doesn't have, and, and the most senior leader or the most senior person in the room doesn't necessarily mean that they will, you know, although you often attention does, does you know, travel upwards, you'll notice the most senior person, but in some cultures, there are behaviors that you can put in place to make sure that they are not always the most dominant voice, and so, so, the, and you know, and I've seen some of those cultures. There are some organisations that are going into flatter hierarchies, uh, flatter hierarchical models, or flatter, you know, operating models because mm -hmm. of that. Um, but I think, from an individual point of view, when you're not getting what you need from a feedback system, then, then, the thing that you can control is your inner world. It's how you react to that. And so, and I was, um, there was um, a really fantastic post on LinkedIn uh, by Lawrence uh, Barrett, who's a Jungian um, thought leader, really. Um, and, um, and he's a coach and he uses Jungian um, or psychodynamic um, ideas in his coaching. And uh, I want to read what he wrote because I think it's really, he's very, he's, he's a lovely, um, he's eloquent, he's a lovely writer as well. So what he says is to really face our shadow self, in other words, those in, that inner voice, that inner self-limiting belief, is to recognize that it can never be defeated. Repressing the possibility that we are weak, cowardly, or foolish, or that we don't know enough, just makes the doubt grow stronger. Our lives then become an endless struggle as we try to run from the dark, and hope that one day we will enter the light and be satisfied and that others will be satisfied with us. And so instead, what he suggests, he says to overcome the shadow, just allow ourselves to have compassion. And so rather than looking at riling against that, you know, going against those forces, going against that, um, that hubris in a way, if we if we are more compassionate with ourselves and we understand that yes we will have those self limiting beliefs yes we will doubt ourselves but that doesn't mean that we can't do the task at hand that we can't do the job at hand that we can't learn to do something we don't know how to do yet that we can't find information that we don't have right now it, so so thinking about it from a process perspective or a growth mindset perspective where we just don't know that yet 
uh, rather than mm. feeling defeated and not good enough and, and always, um, you know, uh, I think what we do, particularly when we rile against that, you get those behaviours where, where and, and I see this again with a lot of the women that I'm, I speak to, where they're continually, continually striving to show that they are competent, to show that they can do ABC, to show that they can juggle um, multiple um, tasks in the personal and career life, uh, to show their worth. And, and in some ways, it's about relaxing, accepting, yes, we don't know everything. Yes, there will be things that I doubt. Yes, I will be doubting myself on things I, I probably don't need to doubt myself on, but I'm just going to treat myself with compassion around that. And I actually like that. It's a really gentle way to deal with that shadow self. I'm a big fan of the Jahari window, you know, the public self, the private self, the hidden self and the unknown self. And I guess the hidden self is is the is the rooster that goes in and puts the Dunning-Kruger effect into practice. They go in with a maximum amount of um, bluster um, and uh, are, are unable or unwilling to, to actually question the limitations of their abilities. The unknown self, I, I, I think um, I think a good organizational leader will be supporting people to flesh out and examine and build on their unknown selves, their 100%. potential. Um, and part of the hidden self for those folks could be some of those self-limiting behaviors and, and beliefs that actually stop them exploring their potential. But I think organizations that are empowering, and I, get, I did my PhD looking at empowerment theory as applied to um, community organizations, people teaching each other and supporting each other to become local advocates around environmental issues. And there's a lot of literature in community psychology around empowering self-help or mutual aid organizations, which I think is relevant to any organization. And that is an empowering organization creates multiple opportunities for its members to explore and develop their leadership potential and supports people to have a go. Um, I've heard a great term in a government organization that said they were safe to, they created a safe to fail culture, which I think actually encourages experimentation and reflection and action learning. And um, I think, you know, an organizational culture that actually is empowering will really encourage people to have a go at trying different things and explore pe what people might be wanting to explore. I can't tell you how many places I've worked that have, I've never had a discussion about my so-called career goals. What, 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 what am I passionate about? What, what would I love to learn? What would I love to lead? Um, what would I love to help the organization grow to do? Absolutely. Those discussions never happened. Yeah, well, I, well, Ian, I think they are happening more in modern, more modern future future fit workplaces that really take a human centered view of, of the workplace. And so, and I think definitely, um, you know, your younger people are looking for that. They're looking for that level yeah. of meaning and that level of dialogue. So I think you know what? some change, but it's not everywhere. Yeah. You're right. The great resignation that apparently is happening everywhere is people saying, look, I don't want to spend my waking hours in a place where no one is interested in what I might love to achieve, both for myself and my community and this organisation. So they'll go somewhere else. And and with that, uh, and that's what that's what we talked about earlier is that agency. So so in some ways, what we've been talking about are things that you can do is change the system by shaping culture. If you're a leader, you can be thinking about those kind of things. If you're an employee in an organisational culture that doesn't um, empower you to embrace some of the things that we've been talking about, then some people will have a choice. Other people won't have a choice. Yeah. You can't assume that everyone has a choice to leave and go somewhere Not else. at all. Yeah. So for those people, I wanted to have the last word today, Ian, if that's okay. <laughs> and again, it's uh, it's Lawrence Barrett, who I really, I'm going to have to do a shout out to him because he's, he's written some beautiful words. So for them... When we feel the doubts of imposter syndrome, we should not look for the positive or comfort, ourselves, or comfort ourselves with the weak tea of being good enough. 
embrace the darkness recognize that like everyone part of you is weak cowardly and foolish and that makes you human and i think we can say that of organizations too right absolutely all right well thank you ian it was lovely to chat to you about imposter my pleasure today. <laughs> and um we'll see you next time look forward to it bye-bye